Today we're going to talk about one of Australia's most gruesome murders, which is the murder of John Price. In February 2000, Catherine Knight viciously murdered, decapitated and skinned her boyfriend John Price and served him on a plate to feed his children. There's a lot to this story. Listener discretion is advised. Let's get into it. Catherine Mary Knight was born on the 24th of October, 1955. Her parents, Jack and Barbara, lived in the small conservative town of Aberdeen in New South Wales, Hunter Valley. However, due to Barbara's affair with her husband's friend and co-worker, Ken Knight, and the backlash received, Barbara and Ken were pretty much forced to move out of town to Maury. Barbara and Jack had four sons. However, after the affair, none of her sons went with her. Catherine's father, Ken, was a disgusting, violent alcoholic who would rape his wife up to 10 times a day. Barbara often discussed her sex life with her daughters and told them how much she hated sex and men. Catherine attended Muswell Brook High School. She was a bit of a loner and is remembered by her old classmate as a bully. She was known to carry a knife in her boots and on one occasion threatened a group of boys with a knife. Even some of her friends were afraid of her. However, when Catherine was not in a rage, it was said she was a model student. Her younger brother Shane also said she was very loving towards him and would always pick up injured strays like cats, dogs, birds and would take them home, get them better and let them go. Catherine left school at the age of 15 and could barely read or write. Her first job was in a clothing factory which she left after 12 months. She then started her dream job at the local abattoir, cutting up offal and was quickly promoted to boning. Catherine was given her own set of knives which she hung over her bed so they would be handy should she need them. This is a habit she continued everywhere she lived. Catherine met David Kellett, a close friend of her brother, in 1973. They went on to marry in 1974. The wedding really wasn't a big deal at all with the couple arriving to the service on a motorbike and David was as drunk as a skunk. Prior to the wedding, Catherine's mum had given David some advice. He said, The old girl said to me to watch out. You better watch this one or she'll fucking kill you. Don't ever think of playing up on her. She'll fucking kill you. And that was her mother talking. And a few hours after the wedding, he would experience just how crazy Catherine was as Kellett woke up to Catherine straddling him and trying to strangle him. She was angry with him because he had fallen asleep after only having sex three times. The marriage was a violent one and on one occasion, Catherine, who was heavily pregnant, was so enraged that Kellett came home late that she took all of his clothes and shoes and burnt them all. She then went on to hit him over the head with a frying pan. Kellett was in fear of his life and ran to a neighbour's house where he collapsed. He was treated for a severely fractured skull. Although police wanted to charge Catherine, she convinced Kellett to drop the charges. Kellett was unable to cope with the abuse and in May of 1978, shortly after the birth of their first child, Melissa, he moved to Queensland with another woman who was also pregnant. This sent Catherine over the edge and the next day she was seen pushing her baby in a pram and violently throwing the pram from side to side. Catherine was admitted into St. Elmo's Hospital in Tanworth. However, once released as an act of revenge against Keller, she took her two-month-old baby Melissa and placed her on a railway track. Fortunately, a local man by the name of Old Ted found Melissa and scooped her up minutes before a train passed. Catherine was also seen that day swinging an axe around her head and threatening people. She was totally out of control. She was again admitted into hospital and was diagnosed with postnatal depression. A few days later after being discharged, Catherine was on the hunt for Kellett. 
She went to a co-worker's house and convinced her that her daughter wasn't well and asked for a ride to the doctor's. The neighbour agreed. However, once in the car, Catherine pulled out a knife and slashed her co-worker's face. The woman managed to escape, but her brother, whom she had brought along with her, was now being held hostage by Catherine. The police were called and managed to disarm Catherine with, would you believe, broomsticks. Catherine was again admitted into hospital. While Catherine was in the hospital, she told the nurses that her intention was to kill the mechanic who had repaired Kellett's car, as this allowed him to leave. The plan was to then go on and kill Keller and her mother-in-law once she arrived in Queensland. David was informed of the incident. He left his girlfriend and moved back to Aberdeen. On the 9th of August 1976, Catherine was released into the care of her husband and her mother-in-law. Shockingly, they went on to have a second child who they named Natasha in 1980. However, by 1984, Catherine was over Kellett and moved into her parents' house and then eventually found a place of her own. Catherine found a job at the local abattoir. However, she had injured her back and would later receive a large lump sum from workers' comp. In 1986, Catherine met David Sanders and after a few months, they started living together. However, David had his own apartment, which he would not give up. This would become a bone of contention for Catherine. She would often throw him out and David would return to his apartment. Catherine would then go and beg him to return. On one occasion, as an act of revenge and a warning, Catherine cut the throat of David's eight-week-old dingo puppy right in front of him and then knocked him unconscious with a frying pan. Despite all of that, in June of 1988, Catherine gave birth to her third daughter, Sarah. They moved into another home, which Catherine used the money from her workers' comp to purchase the house. Catherine decorated the house exactly the way she wanted. It was covered from floor to ceiling in dead animals, animal skins, horns, animal traps, machetes, rakes and pitchforks. David ended the relationship with Catherine for good and went into hiding when she hit him in the face with an iron and stabbed him in the stomach with a pair of scissors. Catherine tried her hardest to find him. She asked several of his friends, but no one would tell her where he was. At some point, David came back to see his daughter. He missed her. He also came back for some of his belongings. However, Catherine had a restraining order out on him. She had told the police that she was the one who was in fact afraid of David. Catherine then met John Chillingworth and in 1991 gave birth to a boy who they named Eric. The relationship with John lasted for about three years as Catherine left John for the man she was having an affair with. His name was John Price. John Charles Thomas Price was born on the 4th of April 1955. John had a great network of friends, was well liked and had a reputation of being a hard worker, a really nice guy. He was also affectionately known as Pricey. His only flaw was that he was a heavy drinker. John had three children. One was married, the other lived with his girlfriend and the youngest lived with his ex-wife. In 1995, despite knowing of Catherine's reputation, John allowed her to move in with her two youngest children. However, just like all of her relationships, cracks started to appear. Catherine had started recording items John had taken from the mines where he worked. Items such as old vacuum cleaners, an expired first aid kit, and she sent these recordings to his boss, which ultimately got him fired. John had worked at the mines for 17 years. Catherine had done this purely out of spite because John refused to marry her. John's friends and family desperately wanted him to get rid of her. John broke up with Catherine. However, after about three months, he took her back. Catherine's violence began to escalate 
just as it had in her past relationships. At one point, she had asked her nephew to steal John's car, burn it, and then throw battery acid in his face. Her nephew refused. Another time during an argument, Catherine stabbed John in the chest with a knife. Again, John's friends and family advised him to get rid of her, but unfortunately, he did not take their advice. As the violence escalated, John became increasingly fearful as to what could possibly happen and began to confide in his boss. And every time an incident took place, whether it was Catherine hitting, punching or yelling at him, he would tell a mate so that if anything were to happen to him, they could bear witness. John desperately wanted Catherine out of his house. And on one occasion, he had called the police to have her put out. However, the police told John he would have to get a court order, which infuriated John as this was his house. John was trapped. Two days before John was killed, they had an argument and Catherine had come at John with a knife. However, the next day, the police arrived at John's house with an AVO, which Catherine had taken out on him. She had called the police and accused John of being violent towards her. On the 29th of February, 2000, the day of his murder, John went to court as he wanted Catherine out of his house. He told the court that the night before he had woken up with Catherine at the foot of his bed with her hand behind her back. He jumped out of bed, however Catherine was standing in front of a mirror and only then could he see that she had nothing in her hand. The court granted him a restraining order. However, both ignored the legal notice they had against each other, which would lead to devastating consequences. John's colleague begged him not to go home, but John was concerned that Catherine would harm his kids if she couldn't get to him. Before arriving home, John would stop by a neighbor's house for a few beers. And before heading home, he told the neighbour that if he saw his van still parked in the driveway in the morning to call the police because she's done me in, John went home and fell asleep. Catherine had organised for her daughter Natasha to babysit her youngest children for the night. She arrived at John's house around 11pm. She still had keys so she let herself in. John woke up when Catherine arrived. They watched some TV, then had a shower. Catherine slipped into a sexy black negligee. They had sex and went to sleep. The next morning, John's neighbour noticed his van still in the driveway, which was unusual, as John always left before him. His work colleagues were also concerned about John as he had not shown up for work, nor had he called in saying he was running late. His colleagues decided to call the police. The police arrived at John's house around 10 past 8 that morning. Officer Scott Matthews and Officer Graham Furlonga were the first to arrive. They knocked on the door. There was no answer. However, they noticed some blood on the door. They looked through the flap on the door and noticed what appeared to be a bunched up curtain just hanging down. The officers decided to make their way to the back of the house and broke in through the back door. They again noticed what appeared to be the curtain they had seen from the front door. As they got closer, Officer Matthews thought it was some type of blanket or some type of covering. So he used his left arm to push it aside and immediately felt a coldness on his left arm. He looked down and his arm was covered in blood. Officer Matthews couldn't understand why he was bleeding. He thought he had injured himself when he broke through the back door. Little did they know, they were about to face the most horrific, the most macabre, the most gruesome scene they would ever witness. Officer Furlonger soon realised that what they thought was a curtain or a blanket was in fact human pelt. It was skin minus the head. After having sex, John had fallen asleep. Catherine had pulled out a knife and started stabbing him in the back. 
John managed to jump out of bed and run down the hallway. However, Catherine was right behind him, still stabbing him in the back and neck. John managed to get to and open the front door, but Catherine continued to stab him repeatedly. She had stabbed him 37 times. Catherine took her time and used the skills she had gained at the abattoir to skin him from his head to his genitals. She then put a meat hook through his head, hung his body and decapitated him. Catherine had removed the skin with such precision that after the post-mortem examination, the skin was able to be re-sewn onto John's body. Not only had Catherine skinned and decapitated John, she had sliced off parts of his buttocks and baked them in the oven and served it up with vegetables for John's two children. She had also put John's head in a large pot with some vegetables. She had also left a vindictive note under each plate for his kids. It was never revealed what the notes contained as the judge would not release the notes in order to protect the children. The police found Catherine laying on the bed. They tried to wake her, but she was unresponsive. It appeared that she had taken a concoction of pills. Catherine was taken to the hospital and interviewed by the police five days later. During the interview, Catherine claimed that she could not remember a single thing. I can't remember anything. She gave absolutely nothing away about what had happened. However, she did admit that she had killed John, claiming that she had committed this gruesome act because of severe domestic violence she had experienced in her life, which included John. Catherine was now trying to spin the narrative that she was a victim of domestic abuse. However, during the investigation, they had found that Catherine had washed, changed her clothes, stolen John's wallet, left the gruesome scene and had gone to an ATM and used John's card to withdraw $1,000. The money was never found. The police interviewed Catherine's ex-partners and it became quite apparent that Catherine was not a victim of domestic violence, but a perpetrator. Her brother also told the police that Catherine had said she would kill John and get away with it because they would think she was mad. Less than a year after John's murder, his family would face seeing Catherine in court. Initially, Catherine pleaded not guilty. However, as the trial commenced, she changed her plea to guilty. During the trial, Catherine was seen by three psychiatrists and they all diagnosed her with a personality disorder, which is not a psychiatric illness. So basically, Catherine was sane at the time of the murder. Catherine Knight became the first female to be sentenced for the term of her natural life without the possibility of parole. Catherine has shown zero remorse and actually had the audacity to appeal the sentence as she thought the sentence was too harsh. She lost the appeal. Catherine has never revealed why she took a man's life so brutally. Thankfully, she will never walk amongst the civilised again. <laughs>